This November, Austin voters will elect a new mayor to lead the 11th largest city in the United States. The city's weird yet inclusive spirit makes it a magnet for people all over the country. And with that steady, rapid growth comes great challenges. An affordability crisis, housing shortage, traffic woes, homelessness. These six Austinites say they have a plan to make the capital city a better place to live for you. Anthony Bradshaw is a security guard. Phil Brule is studying government and history at the University of Texas. If the people who are in office today aren't going to do the right thing, we need to show them that there are people who will. And I think I will. State Representative Celia Israel, a realtor, has represented Austin in the Texas House of Representatives since 2014. I'm not leaving the legislature to do another damn task force. I'm leaving the legislature to lean in on the city that molded me in 1982 to say there's the spirit of Austin, that's what I want out of Austin. Gary Spellman is the co-founder of Ultimate Face Cosmetics, a global beauty brand based in Austin. I know how to work with people, I know how to build teams, uh, and my heart's in the right place. I'm not doing this for fame and glory. I want to be the least known mayor who does the best job. Jennifer Verdon is a real estate broker and small business owner. I'm going to restore common sense and public service back to the mayor's office. I'm going to do away with the distractions and the political ambitions that have been shaping our Austin politics for the past five years. Kurt Watson served as Austin's mayor from 1997 until 2001. In 2006, he was elected to serve in the Texas Senate, where he represented Travis and Bastrop counties until stepping down in 2020. What we need is someone with a proven track record of success of being able to get the big things done that we're going to need to get done. Tonight, they make their case to you to vote, Texas. From KVU News with the Austin American Statesman, this is the Austin Mayoral Debate. We thank you for joining us for the Austin Mayoral Debate. I'm Ashley Goodo, KVU's Managing Editor of Political Content. And I'm Ryan Atulo, City of Austin Government Reporter with the Austin American Statesman will be your moderators for tonight's debate. All six candidates running to be the next mayor of Austin are joining us tonight, so let's begin. Our first question for the night is for all of the candidates. You each will have 45 seconds to respond. Austin's identity, its soul, has changed significantly over the last eight years. What was once the live music capital of the world is now a city where artists are struggling to live and iconic businesses are closing. What's one action you will take to preserve the Keep Austin Weird spirit? Mr. Bradshaw, we'll begin with you. Oh, yes. Um, the Keep Austin um, uh, spirit, uh, I think that um, bring to Austin a a plan that will bring Austin together. I think when you bring Austin together, uh, bring ideas together, bring plans together, then uh, you know that'll keep Austin uh, an Austin a place that Austin uh, can have success. That Austin can thrive on working together. Bring a, a, what you call a family unit to Austin, to where Austin is family. Austin uh, uh, where where Austin uh, find hope and find unity and find strength in Austin, Texas. So I believe uh, every uh, when uh, when Mr. all Bradshaw, people come together, we thank then, you. That's and your then time. things are <laughs> together. Thank you. Mr. Brule. Uh, this is a big thing that my campaign's been working on. Uh, one of the biggest things that we have to do is start changing the culture itself. Uh, the city for too long has been focusing on providing for corporations, providing for realtors, rather than providing for these musicians and artists, as well as small businesses. I remember, you know, you had huts downtown. You had, uh, you, uh, what's it called? Lucy in Disguise is now closing. You have uncommon objects forced to move outside of South Congress. The reason why we have these things is because we no longer cater to those businesses. We no longer support them like we do. And if we think about what Keep Austin Weird is, of course, it's for small business, but how many people do we uh, know about that? How many people from California, New York, understand where that comes from? Boosting such culture and providing tax incentives, providing uh, just overall support for these things rather than corporations like Google, rather than huge things like that. Thank That's you, something Mr. we need Paul. to do. That's your time. Representative Israel. The spirit of Austin drew me here in 1982 as um, someone from El Paso, Texas, someone who was um, just discovering her identity and I was able to work my way through the university as delivering pizzas and having very low rent at the University of Texas Mobile Home Park. That spirit of Austin is leaving us. And 
the spirit of Austin means we got to change the way we build and we got to make sure that we are inviting people in instead of pushing them out. It's, it's the reason I'm running. Um, the working men and women of this city are, have been getting pushed out for far too long and I'm running to make sure that I'm a mayor for all of them and, and, and I'm he channeling their voice in this election. Mr. Spellman, what's one action you will take to preserve the Keep Austin Weird spirit? I think it, it started when I was drawn here. I was drawn here by the love of a good woman, seriously, and that's why I came to Austin. We started a company together. This used to be small business friendly, and um, it's gone away. And remember when you used to go downtown and there was a vibe? We've lost our vibe. So I think the first thing I would do is bring together the people that it matters most to right now. Then we have to look at the affordability. I mean, this is what happens when you overmarket a situation that we're in right now. People come here in mass numbers. I think we're getting 180 people a day. We lose 30 a day, uh, 50 a day, so we're down to like 130 a day. So when you market that much growth, we have to be ready for it. I think our infrastructure was set for 250,000 people when we did this. So I think I would like to sit down with all the parties concerned, especially the live capital. We have to get back to the live music capital of the world. Thank you, Mrs. Verdon. Well, I think I'm the only one here on the panel that is a lifelong Austinite. I've witnessed for the past 55 years the evolution of Austin from a little river city to a world-class city and now into a dirty, crime-ridden city that needs rescuing. However, I am the one who has witnessed all the great things that made Austin why we're all here. The live music capital of Austin, all of our great small businesses, all of our small restaurants that we're watching slowly one by one close. Of course, I would champion all those. We need to start prioritizing, saving all of our iconic restaurants, our iconic music venues, and everything else that makes Austin, Austin. Mr. Watson. Austin, keeping Austin weird is about keeping Austin optimistic. It's about Austin that's always looked to the future and will continue to look to the future. Of course, that means that we're, we have to address cost of living. And the cost of living right now, we're in a cost of living emergency. So you've asked for the one thing that we would all do one of the things that I would do is change the economic development paradigm. So what we do is we focus on putting people in the jobs that are being created. Austinites that are already here, having them trained so that they get on career paths and they'll be able to work in all those jobs that, that are being created. That's a key way to address affordability. And I'll give you a bonus, a second one. We also need to look at child care everywhere in the community and being able to provide child care so that people can stay here regardless of what jobs they have and they'll have an optimistic future. Thank you. Our next round of questions will be directed to individual candidates. The candidate we address will have 45 seconds to respond. Other candidates can offer 30 second rebuttals as chosen by the moderators. Candidates. If you want to offer a rebuttal, just raise your hand. Then we will return to the original candidate for a 30 second closing argument. Our first question is from Mr. Watson. You served as the mayor of Austin from 1997 to 2001. In that time, you helped shape the city's growth and some of the policies that made the city the success it is today. But those policies have also led to some of the challenges Austin faces today. If you could go back and do one thing differently, what would it be? That's a hard question because we had so much success, but if I was going to do one thing differently, I think what I would do is, is be able to predict the future so that when we did some of the things to make things better, for example, when we applied the East Austin zoning overlay so that we could do away with in, environmental racism in the zoning in East Austin. When we moved the airport or when we did the Austin Revitalization Authority, all of those things were things we did with the community and they needed to be done. But in doing those, they made that a more desirable part of the city to live in and that had an impact on displacement and gentrification. So what I wish we had been able to do is predict the future so that maybe we could have done some things at that moment in time. Thank you. Representative Israel, you put your hand up. Yeah, I, I feel compelled to point out that we're one of the most economically divided cities in the United States. These are not just problems that surfaced in the last 10 years. These are, not, these are problems that surfaced generations ago. So we failed to address the unintended consequences of those smart growth policies. But it's not just, well, we shrug our shoulders and let's, you know, uh, be sad about it. 
it's we've lost community. We've lost the spirit of Austin to your first question. The spirit of Austin is it just place. The spirit of Austin is people. It's those people that, that, I'm, that I'm, I'm running to represent tonight. Mr. Watson, do you want to respond? Yeah, my, my response would be that, that the great success that we had um, is, is something that we ought to be celebrating. There are things that we ought to learn from the past. For example, Miller is a great development and a, a national model. But there are some aspects of that that we could do differently and make it better and more perfect. Um, but we had great success, and it, it, it's, it's one of those things that we, we want to build on it and not, not be always saying that there's something negative. The optimism for the future is what we need to have. Thank you. Our next question is for Representative Israel. One of the key pillars of your campaign is protecting reproductive rights and sexual health. However, and you know this, the state of Texas has not only made abortion illegal, it's penalizing those who, quote, aid and abet a woman in obtaining an abortion. And members of the legislature are talking about filing bills to make it even harder for Texas women to get abortions. So what could you as mayor and the city actually do regarding reproductive health? I don't know. I don't think people understand that as women, we're not just disappointed, um, we're not just dismayed, we're angry. Our bodily, our bodily autonomy is, is gone. So as mayor, um, I have put out a policy that says, I got your back to all of those who need um, health care and need an abortion. That means uh, making sure that we can make sure that all those nonprofit organizations who were providing these services, they're all pivoting now to the state of New Mexico, which is our closest place where, where, where women can get a safe and legal abortion. We need to be connected to them and say, we got your back. We're going to make sure you get there safely and without intimidation and without worrying about that you're, you're, you're on your phone in a public place and you're doing search to say, where can I get a safe abortion? And would you do that at the risk of costing the city potentially thousands of dollars in lawsuits from the state? There, there are, there's an opportunity for us to to stand strong in, in our values and what we believe. Overwhelmingly, the, the women and those who, who, are, who are in Austin will expect me as mayor to stand strong in what we believe, and I believe abortion rights is part of that. Mr. Bradshaw. I just want a question to say that um, you have to say that is, is abortion really safe? Because the result of abortion that, that, that comes from abortion is the, is the feedback that who uh, those women who do have abortions uh, can't sleep, go through all difficult changes and things like that. So there is no safe. I, I never seen a, a, a what you call a safe abortion, not one. Uh, I, 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 I never even heard of one. Yeah. Representative Israel, would you like to respond? In the in the nine years that I've been in the Texas Legislature, I have had enough mansplaining to last me a lifetime. And Mr. Bradshaw doesn't understand what it's like to live in fear, to not even want to get pregnant at this time. And it's a sad commentary on where our society is today. This question is for Mrs. Verdon. In the 2020 election, you made nine donations to the Republican Political Action Committee, WinRed, totaling more than $300 to reelect former President Donald Trump. The majority of the Austin Council and its previous mayors are or have been Democrats. If elected mayor, how do you expect to get things done with a council whose political views are so different from your own? I think that just comes from being an excellent team builder and consensus builder. I've learned throughout my career of being in general contracting specifically that I deal with a very diverse group of players that come from all walks of life, all the way up from engineers, builders, uh, the, all the subs from insulation, electrical, plumbing, etc. Everybody comes from a different place with a different um, set of morals and boundaries and, and everything that they believe in, religion. And I think it's just a matter of finding the core focus of what we're trying to do in city government, which is focus on core municipal services and functions and stay focused on those things. That is the core purpose of city government and that is what I intend to stay focused on and rally um, all of the council members' constituents and just make sure I sell them on common sense policies. Thank you. Mr. Brule, as you know, Austin is the 11th largest city in the country. The council oversees a $5 billion budget, a workforce of more than 13,000 people, and makes decisions impacting the lives of about 1 million residents. You are a college student. 
with not even half of the lived experiences the other candidates on this stage. What makes you qualified to lead the city? Thank you so much for that question. On a daily basis at UT, I have access to basically unlimited resources. I have an internship down at the Capitol that forces me to look at uh, issues here in our city as well as statewide and see how they interact. And the biggest thing is that I'm a born and raised Austinite. I work three part-time jobs, I balance a busy schedule, I get very little sleep, and I deal with the problems that Austinites face. Right now I share a five bedroom place with two bathrooms. Our doorknob fell off a month ago and we used plenty of duct tape to fix it. It's things like this that allow me to understand what is actually happening in the city rather than sympathizing from a penthouse balcony. It's small things like that that allow me to stand above my fellow competitors and show that I can actually service this community well and uh, effectively. Thank you. Our next question is for Mr. Spellman. Ahead of this debate, I interviewed you about your platform. When asked about affordability as it relates to housing, you said you want to see a fair market, but quote, if it costs that much to live here, it costs that much to live here. You went on to say, quote, you can't go live in Malibu Beach unless you have a $20 million check, you know, so there's going to be prohibits here that say, hey, I don't have the money to live in Austin, end quote. Now, study after study shows a community is most robust when it includes people on all points of the economic spectrum. So how can Austin be a world class city if only the wealthy can afford to live here? Well, thank you for that. End quote. Um, what I'd like to say is, you know, this is what it costs to live here. This is a byproduct of all the previous administrations. We overmarketed the city. We have more people come here. We have shortage of housing, and that's what it costs to live here. Right now, we have a three billion dollar deficit in our state and our city. So where does the money come from to make it affordable? We're going to have to dig deep and find out where we can find this money, how we make it affordable. But if that's what it costs, like the coolest thing is we were at the Urban League and a, and a homeless man was on the, the council named Denver and that was the same question and he answered the question and he said, when I stop being homeless, I'm going to have property and I don't want the city telling me how much I can charge for my rentals. That's as simple as it is. This is what it costs to live here. We have to work on making it affordable, but that's what it costs right now. Uh, Representative Israel. Yeah, uh, I just refuse to accept that we're doing everything that we can, and that's why I'm in this race. If, if, we, if we don't elect a pro-housing mayor and a pro-housing council who understand the nurse, the teacher, the, 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 uh, the 911 call operator, we can't just shrug our shoulders and say, well, it, I guess we're turning into Malibu. It's, uh, I appreciate where Mr. Mr. Spellman is coming from, but this is going to take intentional, determined action on the part of, of the city to work with the county and our region to say we can do so much better. We're losing not just our diversity, we're losing our economic strength. And I want to be that kind of mayor. Mr. Spellman, would you like to respond? I agree with her. We have to dig deep. We have to change policy. But right now, this is where we're at. And all the yelling and promising from this stage is not going to change it until someone gets in office and does it. Mr. Bradshaw, as the campaign season has ramped up, your presence has drawn down. You have skipped multiple mayoral forums. You canceled an interview at KVU News just a few hours before it was set to begin. And you were the only candidate who did not fill out the American Statesman candidate questionnaire. Why are you skipping out on the events that give Austinites a chance to learn more about you? And how can they be sure you will show up for them as mayor? <laughs> well, uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, me, my first time as mayor in Austin, Texas, uh, I, had, I have to do a lot of campaigning uh, to get out there and let people know. And, and now you get a chance to, uh, to, to see who I am um, uh, in, in, uh, you know, uh, in Austin. Um, I don't think that the word skipping out is, are, are, is, is the right phrase. I, I think I come here to Austin to let people know who I am, that I'm here for Austin, that I'm, uh, that I'm here for uh, the uh, Austin people. I'm here to serve. I'm here to help. I'm here to make a change in Austin that's going to make a difference. Uh, I believe that, you know, that's what takes somebody with heart, somebody who cares about our police department, somebody who cares about our communities in Austin, Texas. Thank you. So that's what I'm here for. Mr. Brewer, you had your hand raised. Absolutely. I just wanted to agree with uh, Mr. Bradshaw there because I've also been guilty of missing certain events due to work, during, due to school, during, due to sickness. For me and Mr. Bradshaw, 
this isn't a full-time job. We cannot, you know, go out and campaign 24-7 and still be able to live a normal life. We have to earn our bills because we are normal people of this city. And then when you accuse that of, oh, you're skipping, he has his reasons. He has to work, unlike some other people that may have the time to relax, may have the money, the donated money to survive, while a lot of this money might be coming out of my pocket or his pocket, rather than being able to relax. Thank you. Mr. Bradshaw, he agreed with you. Anything to Mrs. respond? Uh, I'm completely fine with what you said. No, okay. no problem with me. That's Representative fine. Israel. Yeah, I'd like to point out that, yes, it does take time, it does take resources, it does, does take energy. Um, I get that. And the, the sole reason that I'm able to do this full time with the energy that I have been able to do, we've had over 36 fundraisers, hundreds of events, is because my wife and I all bought two houses a long, long time ago. We sold one. We built wealth. And that's what I'm surviving on right now. I'm a realtor. My wife works at HEB, but I'm not doing any business right now. I'm putting my whole heart and soul into this at this moment in time because it's that important to me. Mr. Brule, are you responding to Representative? Sorry. Yes. Uh, that's fantastic, but a lot of us can't afford to buy two homes. A lot of us are new to the game. Like I said, uh, uh, I'm a college student. I'm born and raised here in Austin, but I never had that opportunity to have that excess wealth ready to go in my pocket and be able to have the ability to sell it off and be comfortable. A lot of people in Austin don't have that, uh, that sort of ad advantage or that resource. Just want to go back to that original question because this has turned into a, a bit different. We're talking about the commitment. The other five of you on this stage did show up for those interviews. The other five of you on this stage did fill out those questionnaires. Mr. Bradshaw, there's just this concern about your commitment to this process. Well, yes, my commitment is to make a difference. My commitment is to people and to change. I believe what I have, to, uh, I, I believe what I have to offer is what a police officer talked to me. He said, you know, Mr. Bradshaw, he said he wants somebody with common sense who, who, who's there for the people. And, you know, commitment is that, it's not the point that I don't show up for you. Commitment is I am committed to the people. When I'm, and, and, and so, I mean, that make a difference. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's like more than saying that you are committed. I mean, that you are committed. The thing is that you are committed to help the people and you have to be committed to help the people. And I am there, like I told the police force, hey man, I am there for y'all guys, man. And I will be there. And you know what, I will make a stand. So, you know, uh, uh, you know one thing about commitment, I will be there and I will show up and take care as mayor and, and I will get things done. No doubt about that. Thank you. Sure. Well, this next question is for all of the candidates, and it's our first lightning round question. So in one word, do you support Austin's $350 million affordable housing bond? Mr. Spellman. Yes. Mr. Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Brule. A thousand times yes. Mr. Watson. Yes. Representative Israel. Yes. Mrs. Verdon. No. All right. Our next question is for all of the candidates. Each of you will have 45 seconds to respond. And if a candidate would like to offer a rebuttal, remember, just motion to the moderators. What will you do as mayor to increase housing supply while also preserving the culture of existing neighborhoods? We'll start with Mr. Brule. Uh, one of the biggest things is changing the development code. It's currently almost 40 years old. And in that same time, Austin's population has tripled. And when we change the development code, it allows for more housing to hit the market sooner. Uh, but that's only temporary. One of the biggest things that we also need to do is take advantage of Austin's uh, property wealth, taking empty lots or uh, buildings that have outlived their purpose and turning them into multifamily housing. And when it comes to preserving culture, one of the biggest things we can do is set up uh, limitations. Of course, in certain neighborhoods, you don't want huge neighborhood, uh, apartment complexes popping up left and right. But you can have duplexes. You can have triplexes. It's small things that you can adjust that allow to preserve the culture, have pretty neighborhoods, but it still provide more housing to the market quickly. Mr. Bradshaw. Yes. Uh, I believe that uh, housing supply, well, I mean, if you look at houses and development, you can see there's, there's a shortage because of the interest rates and things like that are going up. So I think uh, if you look at the housing market, it's going to be very, very slow because of the interest rates are very high. So uh, I think that, you know, on developing in Austin, Texas, it's going to be a very slow movement. But if you look, on, uh, if you look at houses that are being overtook, uh, that are being overran, which I'm trying to make the short as I can, um, look on East Austin, where East Austin is suffering 
in the housing development area. Uh, East Austin is, is one of the houses that you see uh, East Austin begin to change uh, more than any area in Austin, Texas. As you begin to see in East Austin, you begin to see where, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> East Austin is suffering and uh, you see uh, uh, East Austin changing. I, well, I'm, I'm not ready to, I can't wait to go ahead. Representative Israel. We've got to cut the red tape when it comes to our permitting process. These are not new problems. These are generations old problems. My wife and I are between homes right now. We're renting and we got that notice from the property management company that said $300 more a month, take it or leave it. This speaks to our lack of housing supply. Um, we put out a policy in June that specifically called out doing public good with public place. We have an opportunity to take a, uh, an underutilized uh, parking lot, a, uh, AISD is going through this process right now with looking at what, what is no longer a school and building community. Um, we, ha we have an opportunity to take those empty spaces. We have 6,000 tracts of land that the city of Austin has owned. One of the reasons I'm in this race is because it takes so long. We have studied it and analyzed for ages. Thank you for your time. Thank you, excuse me, that is your time rather. Mr. Spellman, I will read the question again. What will you do as mayor to increase housing supply while also preserving the culture of our existing neighborhoods? I think it goes to the districts. Uh, each, there's 10 district council people. They're gonna want different uses of the land. I think when you look at the unique opportunity and when you speak of culture, each one of these districts has its own unique culture. How you support the culture is be one of them. Understand their needs. You have to revamp how we use the land use bills like everyone's agreeing on. Uh, it's, it's a very old, I think it's 38 years old. I mean, how can you exist in this 11th largest city if you haven't redeveloped or replanned anything you're doing? Uh, how can you exist in this city when you have the same thing happening over and over again? And here we sit at another mayoral debate talking about the same things we talked about 10 years ago. So I think fresh ideas, you have to be more uh, proactive and you have to work closer with each uh, council person. And we have to make better use of the land that we already own as uh, Austin. Mrs. Verdon. Well, I'm proud to say that I was the very first mayoral candidate to release my very detailed policy paper on housing, land development code, and permitting. And that's been on my website at jenniferforaustin.com. And it does, uh, it outlines many ways that we can quickly increase the diversity and supply of housing. But also I want everyone to know that I am definitely the candidate that is into respecting existing deed restrictions and preserving the unique charm and character of each individual unique pocket of Austin. Everybody knows that even in every district, they're not all the same. There are very, very many unique pockets in each district. Our districts are very large and, it, and our land development code should never be something that's done by district that will not work, that will homogenize Austin and give um, a, an inordinate amount of influence to whoever the existing council member is at the time that will affect generations to come in each district. But please, I, my time is up. Thank you. And finally, Mr. Watson. Uh, there would be multiple things that I would want to do, but I'll mention three. Number one is I want to sunset the development services department, from, review it from top to bottom, uh, soup to nuts, to make sure that we're operating in an efficient way and that we're doing best practices so that the time value of money doesn't end up costing. We can get more housing on the ground and, and, and respect neighborhoods. Second thing I would mention, we need to make it easier for, for people to build accessory dwelling units or to not have to build a McMansion, but instead of that McMansion, they be, they're able to build a duplex, triplex, or fourplex. And then the third thing I'll mention in this answer is we need to focus on the transit corridors and make sure we're building appropriate density for those transit corridors. And we're gonna stick on housing. This question is for all of the candidates. Austin's previous attempt to update the land development code, known as Code Next, failed but you all have talked about the need to modernize the code. What's one change you want to see to the city's code? We'll start with Mrs. Burden. Well, there are many more than just one, but one thing we could possibly do, which I think would be a great idea, is to reduce the uh, minimum lot size from 5,750 to 5,000 square feet, even down to 4,000 square feet or even 3,000 square feet for such things as row homes, duplexes, townhomes, and of course, ADUs, and we need to expand the concept of ADUs. There, um, th there are many more things than just one. Representative Israel. 
If I had to pick one, I would say it takes too damn long to build a fourplex or a sixplex. Um, it's one of the one of my moments in this race when I realized that it, the city treats a 300 unit apartment complex the same way it treats a fourplex. It t it should not take two years to build uh, a fourplex where it, where it makes sense to build a fourplex. What we are what we end up doing is incentivizing more McMansions or a big house and a little house, and and we're losing out on that opportunity to build community in the heart of the city. Thank you, Mr. Watson. I would make it easier to convert some of our existing office buildings into housing, and that would also include reducing parking requirements. Um, and in terms of compatibility standards, those instances where um, a building, it's, a, it's an office, it's a, it's a commercial use, but because it sits on a residential property, it triggers uh, certain compatibility standards, which would then make it more difficult to put housing on that property. Thank you. Mr. Brohl, what's one change you want to see to the city's land development code? Uh, one of the biggest changes I'd make is basically looking at the goal of Code Next. Code Next wanted to try to change everything all at once, all at the same time, and if it didn't work, nothing changes. Uh, it should strive more to be changing what you can change, doing what you can do that's easy, very quick to change, and then tackle the big stuff later on when you get uh, more districts involved, when you get city council involved, when you get the communities involved. But that is, shouldn't leave out the small things that we can quickly adjust, like uh, building fourplexes, like parking requirements, stuff like that to where we can just get the ball rolling and then momentum will allow the rest to happen. Mr. Spellman. Uh, everything they said. It's an easy fix if we have all these great minds working on it, but it has to be more transparent and you have to expedite the system. It takes way too long to get things done in Austin. As a small business owner, uh, yeah, it takes a, a minute to build. And Mr. Bradshaw. Yes, I think, uh, I think uh, one, once you get people's minds together, and uh, um, I think changes ought, ought to be made. I want to say this because I know I got a few minutes here. Um, when you see uh, developers coming into East Austin and they're losing their homes and their places to stay, uh, you know, you see because of land developers coming in, uh, people buying out those who don't have the money, uh, buying out uh, those poor black people who don't have the money. Uh, so when you see people come in like that, you begin to see change take place. And, and also you begin to see smaller lots take place in Austin, Texas, especially in East Austin. People are suffering from a lack, and it's been happening for a long time. So uh, definitely when you see uh, people come in, uh, land developers in Austin, Texas, man, you, you see a, a lot of people losing their, their, their homes and things like that. That's all I want to say. Thank you. It is time for another lightning round question. Candidates, please remember we are looking for a one to two word answer. The question, when was the last time you took public transportation in Austin? Mr. Watson. It's been probably just before the pandemic. Mrs. Verdon. It's been a while. Mr. Spellman. Does Uber count? No. No, then it was before the pandemic. Representative Israel. I took the airport flyer uh, in the midst of the pandemic. I took the airport flyer from the from the airport to the Capitol. Mr. Brule. Uh, about a week ago. Mr. Bradshaw. About, uh, about three months ago. All right. We thank you guys for those answers and that brings us to our next question for each of the candidate and it is about transportation hence that lightning round question so many of you have talked about ways to address austin's traffic woes with public transportation but what about people who would rather drive their vehicles what will you do to ease their commute we'll start with representative israel people are not anti-transit they're anti-inefficiency i've served in the legislature for uh for four years and i've been on the transportation committee I, I mentioned transit because my dad was a truck driver and my mom never got her driver's license. So for us, transit uh, was a way of life for our family and it was fun, it was exciting, it was an adventure. And more, more importantly, transit is equity. But not, it's not going to be for everybody. But if more of us are saying, I could take that bus on Tuesdays or I can take that bus on Thursdays, that's more people that are either telecommuting or they're out of your way. So every great American city needs a great transit system. We've got to make sure that we're moving forward with Project Connect because it's about equity and bringing people together. But I'll remind you, the question is about people who want to drive their cars. Let's get more people out of their way. Got <laughs> That's it. That's my point. Got it. Mr. Brule. <laughs> 
Uh, couldn't agree more. Uh, one of the other things that I would do is also look at construction. Uh, we have a lot of projects that will take months on months on months because of permitting, because of uh, restrictions, and that just turns you know three lane roads into one lane roads that closes roads entirely, especially uh, on 21st and where Guadalupe meet. Uh, when we can speed up these processes, at least for the, uh, the everyday driver, we can get more construction off the street quicker and free up the more roads. Mrs. Verdon. So this is where I shine. I think first and foremost we need to prioritize actually relieving traffic congestion whenever considering any transportation project. We need to work with TxDOT to maximize state investment in state, Austin state owned roads. We need to use more predictive uh, light synchronization to improve existing traffic flows. We need to expand high volume roads where possible. We need to stop counterproductively removing traffic lanes from existing right of way and just use common sense. Mr. Spellman, I'll repeat the question. How will you ease commutes for Austinites who want to drive? I think when you look at it, 81% of the people in Austin drive. So that's a big number of people. Uh, I think we have to rethink how we do things, and that is we want to move people, not cars. So if you want to get 81% of these people happy with what you do, and I think we have to optimize our toll roads. I think we have to reroute traffic. And everything that we're talking about right now is going to be more digging, more slowing down of traffic. If you think this is a hot topic now, when you start digging and you start making 360 improvements. So in order for them to go, we have to move up people on other forms of transportation, like public transportation to free up the highway. Mr. Watson? Yeah, sure. The, um, one of the first things we need to do is we need to, while trying to get the best results for the road, uh, we need to make sure that I-35 functions better as a roadway for uh, passenger traffic. Uh, the other thing we need to do is we had, uh, several years ago, there was $750 million worth of bonds passed for transportation. We need to make sure that that's being put to use in an accountable and transparent way. Um, and we need to have accountability on that money so that we make a difference in people's lives. And then I've also recommended that what we do is we create kind of a, an emergency operations center, if you will, with all of the work that's going to be going on uh, in the area of transportation so that it's coordinated so that people aren't stuck here because of something that's happening and then they're stuck here in another place because of what's happening and there's a better coordination of the work that's going to go on. Representative Israel, rebuttal. Yeah, uh, when, when Kirk talks about an emergency transportation center, the rest of us are going to pick up our phones and look at Google Maps to figure out what's the best route in. And secondly, there's, this is, I-35 is not just a generational decision, it's a multi-generational decision. And I have uh, led the effort with our Travis County delegation to challenge TxDOT because it's, it's not an Austin plan. And we will, be, we will be wasting our resources if we just expand those lanes and mow down uh, 100 businesses and homes without understanding that we're not making it better and we're certainly not doing better by the planet Earth. Thank you. Mr. Watson, back to you. Yeah, maybe there's a misunderstanding about what I'm talking about. We need to coordinate all of the different things that are going on. TxDOT's doing things, the county will be doing things, the city will be doing things, and that needs to be coordinated. I don't want there to be uh, dysfunction because people aren't paying attention to what's going on. Uh, I'm not sure what Google Maps would do for that. In addition to that, I've been pushing for years, most of the traffic on I-35 is generated in this region. We have got to reduce the congestion that's on I-35 and, and do it in the right way, working cooperatively with TxDOT. Mr. Bradshaw, finish us off. Okay, yes, I, I think, um, you know, uh, with traffic in Austin, Texas, um, I guess there's, there's no really great plan to it. Uh, traffic is increasing in Austin, Texas, and um, people are going back and forth to work, and people are, 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 are and traveling, you know, uh, into Austin, Texas. So I, I think you have to just really come up with a, a plan, work together, put your minds together, and, and, and see what you can come up with. I think you can put a, a bunch of ideas together and just talk about it and say, okay, this, uh, I, this, this is better. Uh, Austin is a busy place and, and, and people are busy. And I think if you come together and, 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 and put your mind together, maybe you can come up with a plan that's different. I mean, uh, you know, you can put people on buses, bikes, or you can put people on railroads. Well, it's up to the people. And I think you, uh, I think what you have to do is uh, kind of see. Thank they you. said, 
Okay, go ahead. Your time is up. Candidates. In November 2020, voters approved a $7 billion expansion of Project Connect. Almost two years later, the cost of just the light rail portion alone has nearly doubled. How will you ensure Austin voters get what they voted for without having to ask them for more money? Again, you each have 45 seconds to respond. We'll start with you, Mr. Bradshaw. I said it again, if you don't mind. Say that again, if you don't mind. Re if you, repeat yeah, the, could, could you repeat that? I can read it again, yes. Yeah. In November 2020, Austin voters approved Project Connect, $7 billion transit system. And the cost of that, the light rail portion alone, has nearly doubled at this point. How can you ensure that Austin voters are going to get what they were promised without having to go back to them for more money? <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, well, I think uh, with the railroad system, um, uh, I think um, you can create a fund. Uh, I think you uh, cre create a fund that will um, that that uh, that uh, that will not uh, uh, that will that will not affect the, the uh, taxpayers. Because if you create a fund, then it'll take the burden off the taxpayers. And I, I believe, man, taxpayers uh, they uh, they are burdened with a lot. So I think uh, working together with the city council and things like that, just come up with a plan to find ways to get the burden off the taxpayer. That, I think that may be about me. You mentioned a fund. Yeah. Where will the money come from for that fund? Well, um, if not taxpayers, where? Not taxpayers. Well, I think um, uh, if you talk about a fund, uh, it could be something that will. Um, um, you can, <laughs> I mean, you can also go to places where, see where people who will like to give into a fund. I don't know exactly. Uh, uh, what I think if you get together and talk about that plan, I, I believe you can come with a very effective plan. But if people donate to a plan, I mean, find out what, what would people like to donate to? Because if you expand in the railroad, a lot of people want it, a lot of people don't want it. So, so, so what you have to do is find those who want to uh, advance that plan and let those who, and, and, and get a vote. Like they say, 60% of Austin would like to see the uh, highway expand. Thank so, you. Yeah, Time ahead. is up. Mr. Brule. Uh, the biggest problem with Project Connect when it was uh, originally passed is it was sort of pro uh, projected as a, a dream solution, something that would magically appear and provide the solution to everything. As we can see that Austin has dragged its feet and provided a plan that goes through limestone, goes under a lake, and is obviously not cost effective. Right now you said it's $10 billion. I guarantee you by the end of the project, if we do continue, it'll be upwards of $20 billion, maybe even higher. What I would do as mayor is call for another vote. Allow the people to vote to see if they truly still want this, because it's no longer a dream. It's reality. Allow us to reevaluate. Allow us to redesign the plan so it isn't something out of a sci-fi sci movie. And if they still want it, go for it. But I gladly guarantee that the people of Austin do not want that plan anymore. Representative Israel. When we heard from the voters, they spoke loudly and clearly in support of Project Connect. And I was very excited to to, to see that as somebody who has served as the president of the Alliance for Public Transportation over the years, who has served on the Transportation Committee at the legislature and challenged our state to be more cooperative with our cities. This is an opportunity for us to live up to that and own that uniform that is the 11th largest city in the country. We need a robust transit plan because it is about equity. We, we, we cannot forego this opportunity for a number of reasons, for equity, for connectedness, and most importantly, this is an environmental impact that, that we can do something about the climate change that's happening. Okay, Mr. Spellman, how will you ensure Austin voters get what they voted for on Project Connect without having to ask them for more money? Transparency. Um, every one of the questions we're answering right now is based on problems we've had for years. Uh, I think leadership comes down to this. We have to rethink our traffic patterns along with our building patterns and how they go hand in hand. I think affordable housing is one of those areas where you could come in and you could see where the problems will exist. I think Project Connect was a lot like Phil said. It was a very pie-in-the-sky idea, but it had merit. So we have to go back and redo that. So it becomes, like Celia said, we're the 11th largest city. We should be behaving much better and acting like it. And that's why we're on this stage trying to be the next mayor of Austin, because quite frankly, our leadership isn't doing it. Mrs. Verdon. Well, at best, Project Connect was 
a, uh, it was a bait and switch, or it was just a hypothetical vote. As we all know now, it was sold to us at $7.1 billion, which I've been campaigning against since its inception. Now it's at $12 billion to $20 billion, no tunnel, no rail lines, and, and basically what we're only going to be able to afford in the original budget is probably some bus rapid transit lines, which are great. They're versatile and much, much more flexible, easily, easily adaptable as our needs change. However, I do think that we need to put Project Connect back before the voters with absolute clarity and transparency on what we can expect on a real budget. And if it's not what we voted on, then it should not move forward, quite frankly. I mean, and also, when we talk about affordability in Austin, $7.1 billion was just enough to raise the city portion of our property taxes over 20%. We cannot keep voting for these bonds and these pie-in-the-sky comprehensive dreams that are raising the cost of living Thank in Austin. Thank you, Ms. Burden. That's your time. You. Representative Israel, you wanted to offer a rebuttal. You know, I, 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 think, um, I think Ms. Burden needs to bear in mind, and we all need to bear in mind, yes, it was passed overwhelmingly by the voters. It was, it's way past time for us to grow this transit system equitably north, south, east, west. But it is... Um, it's going to take time, and, and the engineering is now at 30 percent. I've never been one to act like I was a transportation engineer as much as sometimes I have my opinions on it. Let's look at the engineering, let's look at what the voters approved, and let's be thoughtful about it because it was overwhelmingly supported, and it's something that we desperately need to build equity and build connections and help the environment. Do you want to respond to Representative Israel? Uh, absolutely, that is a $7.1 billion project is not something that we've, uh, we, we voted on $7.1 billion. What, what they overwhelmingly approved is, is absolutely not what we are going to get. So it absolutely needs to go back to the voters, with, like I said earlier, with extreme clarity and maybe some real projections and a real performer this time. Mr. Brill, you want to offer a rebuttal? Absolutely. Uh, we talked about uh, Project Connect uh, allowing equity to increase. But I've talked to a lot of people, and sometimes Project Connect doesn't even serve some of our districts. It completely skips a lot of areas and charges them the same cost. So when it comes to a reevaluation, I agree that Project Connect can increase equity here in this city, but you can't uh, use that as a flagship or as a promise when it doesn't even serve some of this city. And so I believe he was rebutting to you, Representative Israel, so would you like to respond? Yes. I am the only person in this, in this race who... who for me, transit is personal. Not only did I write it as a, as a kid in El Paso, Texas, I wrote it throughout my years at the University of Texas, and I wrote it as a young professional. The number seven is a beautiful line that cuts right down Duval. As mayor, I will make sure that we are being, that we are being transparent and that we are fulfilling that promise and being uh, connected to our transit authority and a true partnership with the city. It, my lived experience is different. And I have high aspirations and high big dreams for this city, and it includes a robust, grown-up transportation system. Thank you. Mrs. Vernon, we'll let you close out since this was your question. As Phil said, it's true. Um, when I was running for District 10 City Council in 2020, that was one of my main uh, complaints about the proposed Project Connect was there was no embarkation or debarkation in District 10, yet we were going to be primarily the, the, the bearers for all of the expense based on the property values in that district. And another thing about Project Connect, which even the proponents admitted when they were uh, selling this to Austin taxpayers, it will not even serve 1% of mobility needs in the city of Austin area. Mr. Watson, I'll remind you of the question because we've had a Thank lot you. of conversation yeah. going on. How will you ensure Austin voters get what they voted for on Project Connect without having to ask them for more money? What I want to say first is let's learn from the past. In 2000, rail failed by less than 2,000 votes. It won't pass in the city, but it didn't pass in the whole capital metro area. Think how different and how much cheaper it would have been to do that 20 years ago and what difference it would make in our city. And the voters did vote for this. You have two variables, time and what is it that you're going to build. We need to go in and scrub top to bottom in a very transparent, very accountable way what we're going to build, what we're actually going to build, and how long we're going to take to build it. The voters said they were willing to put up a certain amount of money to have transit, and we need to scrub it to make sure they're getting what they asked for. It's time for another lightning round question. Since this election is only for a two-year term, as approved by voters last year, 
If you win in November, do you plan to run for a second term in 2024? Simple yes or no, we'll start with Representative Israel. I, I live in two-year cycles as a member of the legislature and uh, I'm comfortable with the two years and um, I, I would like to run again to keep fulfilling this, this commitment that I made to the voters. So you are committing to 2024? Lord willing, yes. Thank you. Mr. Spellman? Yes. Mrs. Verdon? Yes. Mr. Watson? That'd be the plan. Mr. Rule? Only if they like me. <laughs> and Mr. Bradshaw? I'm not saying. Thank you. All right, well, our next question is for all of the candidates, and it is about affordability. City staff recently put out the affordable housing scorecard grading the city's progress on its plan to add affordable housing units all across the city. District 10, the most affluent district in Austin, has the lowest score, hitting 0.4% of the 10-year goal. District 6 and 8, they're sitting at just 2%. With land costs what they are, can the city actually afford to put affordable housing in West Austin. We'll start with Mr. Watson. Yeah, I think you can, and I think you have to do a couple of things. One is I've, I've laid out a proposal that would incentivize uh, getting different districts to be a part of, of meeting the baseline when it comes to housing. I've also said that we need to be passing things like uh, what we talked about earlier, which would allow for more uh, duplexes, quadruplexes, uh, triplexes, and ADUs and that would be a citywide thing that would be required uh, to be in every, be allowed in every district. In addition to that, the transit corridors have to be allowed to be built out in such a way that in some instances you're going to want to have minimums. Um, we're going to have to have it have, have affordable housing across the city and in all parts of the city. So we're going to have to use every tool we have. Representative Israel, you wanted to offer a rebuttal. Yeah. Um one of the contrasts I have with, with Kirk's plan is this issue in particular. Taking, taking our needs and splitting them up in 10 different ways to me is a recipe for status quo and um, more of the same. You can't have uh, one, one side of Lamar be car lots that is a dividing line between council districts and the other side of Lamar be mixed use residential. That's not smart um, and it's not helpful to our transit system is if Project Connect uh, when it finally goes down Lamar. So I, I, I just beg to differ that it, that it exacerbates the, 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 the inequities that exist in this city. Uh, Senator Watson. Sure. Um, we have been stagnant now for about a decade on being able to get the kinds of changes we need. We're not going to be able to do it the same old way. And what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to be creative we're going to need to think outside of what has been pushed on us here for the last eight years, which is an all or nothing approach. And that's what my proposals do. They create incentives and a different way to look at things. There's not going to be a situation where some, a, a road like Lamar has different zoning on either side. That's, that's the kind of planning the council can do together, even as you incentivize and encourage districts to do certain types of activity. Mr. Bradshaw, I'll remind you of the question, land costs being what they are, can the city afford to put affordable housing in West Austin? I would say no. Uh, when, you, when you look at uh, what, what Kirk is talking about, when you talk about uh, other districts support another district and things like that. I mean, when you look at the cost of interest rates and things like that that's going on, I think you, I think you put more pressure on those taxpayers. And, uh, you know, uh, when, when you see property going up, uh, uh, over the last two years, uh, uh, property taxes have jumped twice. So when you look at uh, what's going on, uh, you look at all these different things, it, it just sounds like you just pushing things around. So, so it's best to look at what people uh, can afford and property on things like that and see uh, what is the next best move. So I would say no, uh, let's, let's just work with what we got and uh, see what kind of plan we can come up with. Thank you. Mr. Spellman. I'd have to say no. Um, I was just in the middle of a land, of, not in the middle, but I was part of it. And eminent domain gets brought up. If you can't afford the property now, that means you have to execute something called eminent domain where you pay less than what the seller wants to give you. Um, I think there's better ways to do it. I think we have to be more intelligent. 
Um, I think you have to take the people who live there and, and your thoughts. I mean, what are we going to do? Uh, that's a lot of money that you're going to want us to raise and raise taxes to build. And I think when you look at that district, it's it always comes down to us versus them. And we got to stop dividing the city. This is where we live right now. And I think, um, you know, you can't do it. That's just the real estate's expensive there. Representative Israel, with land costs what they are, can the city afford to put affordable housing in West Austin? Absolutely. It's why I'm running. We, can, we cannot afford to, to not take action. When we, can, when we are content with taking the, the, when we are content with pushing the teacher and the, and the bus driver and the 911 call operator out to Bastrop, we are not only losing our diversity, we're losing our economic muscle. How much longer can we expect teachers to come in from Bastrop to teach our kids the next morning, to come in from, from Elgin and come in and take and, and dress our wounds at the intersection of 34th and Lamar at Seton. It, we owe it to them. We owe it to our city. Do we or do we not want to be a great American city? And that means including everybody. And it doesn't cost us anything. It means we gotta we gotta drill down, we gotta cut the red tape, and we've got to act urgently and stop doing sunset reviews and studies and analysis and let's start doing things. Mrs. Verdon. So first of all, nothing is impossible, and I will say, when he says incentivize, I hear the word subsidy. When I hear that we can't do it, we, we, can, do, we can do certain things, but the primary driver of the cost of housing in Austin, hence affordable housing, are property taxes, and I am the only mayoral candidate who has a property tax paper out there on how we can freeze and then reduce the city portion of our property taxes by 3.5%, per year without cutting any services and in addition to that we can we all, will also prioritize addressing AISD recapture which those two things together we could reduce our property taxes in Austin by about 20 to 30 percent and increase the likelihood that eventually we may be able to afford some land in Austin where we can build some affordable housing that isn't outside of the city limits. And Mr. Brule? Uh, I would say yes because we have to. Going off what Celia said about teachers and nurses, there are teachers who pass three or four different school districts on their way to work. How much longer until they realize that these same districts will pay more or even better before they just give up on Austin? Austin is now the seventh least affordable metropolitan area in the country, despite being the 11th largest, despite these wonderful programs we're trying to set up for these people. I grew up in southwest Austin, and my experience of this city is very much different from someone who grows up in east Austin. When it comes to uh, buying property and using property in West Austin, it allows people with lower incomes who need the affordability to have better upbringings, to allow their children to have better lives and experience what I was able to experience as a child and build a better life. Mr. Bradshaw, your hands yeah, in the air. I, yes, I just want to say this. When you, when you talk about affordability, I, I, I'm talking about East Austin. I was in East Austin for like, lived in Austin for like 35 years. And, and uh, um, you know, uh, when you see uh, uh, people who are trying to afford, you see struggling uh, schools, black schools, his, uh, uh, Hispanic schools uh, in East Austin who are struggling affordability. I mean, they cannot afford it. Uh, people in East Austin are struggling uh, to, to make it. And you see them being pushed out of East Austin uh, because of affordability. So uh, that money need to go uh, since Kurt Walsh was in office in 1997, 2001, nothing ever happened for East Austin. So now we see East Austin struggling right now because of a lack of education, a lack of opportunity in East Austin, Texas. Uh, so, so, so we see things struggling in East Austin. Thank you. Mr. Watson, he said your name. Sure. Um, he, he may not know the success that we had. For example, and I mentioned it a minute ago, work, working with the neighborhoods, one of the things that we did was we uh, made, we, we put an end to zoning that was a, a racist vestige of the past where you had industrial zoning in the middle of uh, neighborhoods. You had literally houses located on land that was zoned industrial. We worked with the neighborhoods, we rolled that back. In addition to that, we worked with the Austin Revitalization Authority to make changes in East 11th and 12th Street. We closed an airport that was in East Austin. So, there, and there's more we could talk about, but there was plenty done. Mr. Bradshaw, you want to finish this off? I was talking about East Austin back uh, well, the in- The question was about West Austin. Well, I'm talking about East Austin because East Austin is the one that was struggling, when, uh, uh, struggling for opportunity, a lack of, uh, uh, they were struggling 
for lack of finances and opportunity and jobs. Uh, some are, you know, some are black kids. Or, uh, they said black kids were five times to spend more than their white Caucasians in East Austin. And uh, so that's back uh, uh, and, and that they are faced with difficult challenges. So that's what I was talking about and that's what I was speaking about and our blacks and Hispanics and our poor whites. Uh, in East Austin, East Austin was struggling. Sure, that's what I, that's all I want to break, break the point. Ready. I understand East Austin is struggling, but you've also said that we shouldn't put affordable housing in West Austin. So, well, if you talk about affordable housing in West Austin, West Austin really don't need it, man. Look at Black Austin. I mean, I mean, I mean, just look at East Austin. I mean, if you talk about affordable housing, well, you see, uh, 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 when you see development happen, uh, if you've been in East Austin within the last five years, you begin to see East Austin slowly change. But back in 2001, 1997, 2001, I mean, you see where uh, blacks was being, uh, I guess you can say that our blacks and Hispanics were struggling back then financially uh, with properties and they, and, and they barely, barely could afford to keep their properties. So that's what I was really talking about. Yeah. I want to move on. Okay. Let's move on to homelessness. And we have another lightning round question. Again, candidates, yes or no? Should the city be housing the homeless in hotels? We'll start with Mr. Spellman. No. Mr. Brule? Nope. Mr. Bradshaw? Say it again. Should the city be housing the homeless in hotels? Uh, I, I think you come with a different plan. I really do. I think you come with a different plan. Representative Israel? I would have other preferences. Mrs. Verdon? Absolutely not. Mr. Watson? It, they can play a role, but they shouldn't be the sole way we're addressing the issue. All right, well, this next question is also for all of the candidates. Last year, the Austin Council, Travis County Commissioners, and private sector crafted a $500 million plan to house 3,000 homeless people in three years. As of this summer, the effort is $93 million short on funding. Should the city continue this effort? Mr. Brule, you have 45 seconds. Uh, this effort should not be continued. It was a three-year project for 3,000 beds, and we're not even close. And now the population is, can be upwards of 10,000, uh, according to some estimates. Uh, luckily, fortunately, the Aust uh, Austin does qualify for a lot of federal funding that can help take this weight off of Austin taxpayers. But Austin should not be using this money itself. We've made many good partnerships with the nonprofits here in uh, Travis County. There are thousands of uh, nonprofits, many of them dealing with homelessness. They all have the boots on the ground. They've done the research. They have mental health programs to help these people re uh, be rehabilitated and back into society. Austin needs to stop learning how to build entire foundations from scratch and let the professionals handle it. What we can do for a dollar, they can do for 50 cents or even cheaper. Mrs. Verdon. Can you please repeat the question? Absolutely. The question is, last year, the Austin Council, Travis County Commissioners, and private sector uh, crafted a $500 million plan to house 3,000 homeless people in three years. The plan so far, $93 million short. Should they continue with the effort? Absolutely not. The city of Austin has proven itself um, in, inept in, in, as far as dealing with any of the homeless population. We have spent hundreds of millions of dollars, and the homeless population has only grown. So we need to take a step back. We need to audit all of our homeless expenditures, figure out where the disconnect is, and then start from there. But uh, I think we need to push pause on the city of Austin and, and all the hundreds of millions of dollars are spending on the homeless until we figure out how we're going to address mental health treatment and substance abuse treatment facilities. That is the most important thing that we can do for our homeless population. And we have to exercise a tough love approach. We cannot allow or enable homeless, uh, the homeless lifestyle. We must uh, fully enforce the camping ban, no exceptions. Mr. Watson. This hadn't worked, and it's time for us to reevaluate where we are. Um, part of the reason I think it hadn't worked is that we've been given an all or nothing sort of proposition, uh, camping anywhere you want to camp or uh, hotels and, and permanent supportive housing. And we need more permanent supportive housing. But we also need more rapid rehousing. We need more uh, non congregate shelters. We need to enforce the camping ban. The people have told us they want it enforced and the legislature has enacted a law, but we have no place for people to go when you enforce the camping ban. So we need to have places for people to go. We need to have a more mental health approach and that probably is going to require therapeutic housing in many instances. We need to work with our not-for-profits, bring everybody together, and then 
talk about what the plan is going forward because it, we haven't reached the success that the city deserves. Mrs. Verde. Although Mr. Watson mentions the will of the Austin voters, the will of the Austin voters was to reinstate the camping ban. However, he is proposing adding additional sanctioned campgrounds in Austin. And I will also say that Ms. Israel has also voted to not punish cities who don't uh, decriminalize homeless camping. Mr. Watson, do you want to show? Sure. Um, what, part of what needs to happen here is, is you can't just say we're going to enforce the camping ban and homeless people disappear, people living homeless disappear. One of the things that we need to do in order to help end many of those people living homeless is we need to get them access to services. If you tell somebody you can't sleep here and they have no place to go, you're not benefiting the city by those people not having access to services. So we really do need to create some places they can be and then have access to health care, jobs, uh, job opportunities and, and, and maybe uh, being able to fill out a resume, that sort of thing. It's not enough just to say disappear. Thank you. Representative Israel, should the city move forward with the $500 million plan to house 3,000 homeless individuals? We have a member of my family who was homeless for many, many years. Uh, his name was Tony. He was a genius when he was in school. He, he had one or two body blows in life. And he had a supportive and very wealthy family around him who didn't want him to be homeless. Were it not for foundation communities, he would not have uh, ended up in a dignified place. Um, we have some amazing nonprofits like the Sunrise um, uh, Navigation Center at the intersection of Ben White and Menchaca. It's a faith-based organization that doesn't get a nickel from the, count, from the city or the county. And they have housed over 700 individuals into a place of dignity. So I agree, we do need to reevaluate the problem, but we can't just stop everything. The system, the mental health system included, the public health system, is, is, is moving forward to say these are not just data points, these are our neighbors and they deserve, uh, they de housing is a human right and they deserve our attention. So should we consider, continue on this plan? I think we need to revisit it, but we, we can't just stop it. We, we've got to, we can, we can walk and we can chew gum at the same time. Mr. Spellman. Would you repeat the question one more time, please? Of course. Should the city move forward with the $500 million plan to house 3,000 homeless individuals in three years? And they're 93 million short? They're 93 million short as of this summer. Let's find out why we're short and no, we shouldn't keep investing in it. I think everything that was just said is apropos. Um, there's a crisis on our hands right now and just like uh, the green crisis we're having now and if you look at the situation in our country, we're pushing so hard to become green that we're bringing our country to our knees. You can't just say we're done with the homelessness. It's not going to go away. This is a reoccurring transient population. I think we embrace and this is where uh, being with the Peace, Love, Happiness charity for over 20 years, this, people like Mobile Loaves and Fishes, Tooth, the other guy's foundation, uh, Safe Place, these are all operations that we've worked closely with and they're going to have 2,000 homes out at Mobile Loaves and Fishes, Safe Place. Tooth also has crisis management on site. So I think we have to look at all of our outside influences and our experts, lean on them more just like we have and make sure that we do what's right for our people and stop villainizing the homeless. Mrs. Verdon. So a key word that Gary said was transient, and as we know, when we lifted the camping ban, that, be, that created a, Austin to be a magnet for the homeless. Our po homeless population immediately exploded. Some say we're at 5,000, some say we're at 10,000. We're probably at 12 to 15,000 homeless people now. As Gary said, it's a transient population. As soon as we make it inconvenient and uncomfortable and we don't enable that lifestyle anymore, more people will be willing to come off the streets and accept the help that we, the mental health treatment and the substance abuse treatment that we require. But we have to require that. We cannot let people live unfettered on, in homeless camps or anywhere else in Austin, including sanctioned campgrounds that don't require treatment and um, uh, mental health treatment and substance abuse. Representative Israel, she said something you wanted to respond to. Yeah, I, you know, I went to the warming shelter this spring um, that the Urban League was sponsoring to put myself into that space. There were individuals who had, they have bad family relationships, they don't have the support network. By the grace of God go any single one of us and we should never forget that. But to say that we are being a magnet is not backed up by any, by any data. It's, it's an assumption. Again, this is a crisis. We have got to work together as a community to address it. But, but using tactics like phrases to say this is a magnet does not help the situation. Mr. Spellman, do you want to finish this off? 
yeah, I think uh, we're heading in the right direction by not going forward with this plan. I think it's a, it's got to be back to the communities to embrace one another and help each other. And I think what we have with our nonprofits is the best way. And Mr. Bradshaw, you're the yeah. last to answer yes. this okay. question. Okay. Yeah, Grace. Uh, yes, I was uh, uh, out on the street campaigning, and I uh, just I talked to a guy. Some, uh, uh, some guys. Well, a guy came up to me with a great idea. He said, "Hey, man, why don't you?" Uh, get the pastors together. I believe we got some great pastors in Austin, Texas, who would love to help the homeless, work with them, talk with them, because uh, homeless are people who are hurting. They are people, and they are hurting. So I think, uh, I think what you can do, uh, don't just throw away the plan, but keep the plan in mind. Because I believe if, you know, there, there are different ways to help the homeless. They need counseling. And a lot of churches in Austin can, can give counseling to help the homeless and to change things for them and make a difference for them. Also, they can, uh, you know, kind of benefit them by, you know, uh, giving them places to stay. Some, some, uh, some churches can, some churches can't. So, thank you. Let's move on to policing and public safety. The relationship between the Austin City Council, the community, and the Austin Police Department is fractured. On one hand, there are calls to reimagine policing, and on the other, response times are slower and the crime rate for certain offenses is increasing. How will you balance the safety needs of the city with improving the culture at APD and holding officers accountable for misconduct? We'll start with Mrs. Verdon. Well, first, as you know, public safety is a, one of the top two issues in my campaign. Um, of course, it, it dovetails with the homeless population, but Regarding public safety and the, the relationship between City Council and the Austin Police Department, yes, they have a terrible relationship. We must immediately restore. The mayor and council are responsible for establishing a good morale with the Austin Police Department. If we don't have a good morale at the Austin Police Department, it's going to make it even more difficult for us to recruit quality candidates from around the nation, and we are competing with police departments all over the United States for those limited quality candidates. We have to restore that relationship. We have to make sure that the uh, city manager does his job as far as dealing with the, uh, the Austin Police Department as well. Mr. Bradshaw. Yes, I, I definitely agree uh, uh, with that, uh, that the city, that uh, to have a good relationship with the police department and with the city manager, man, because our police department definitely need to expand uh, need to have a good connection, man. I, I think I think we should expand our police department. We should uh, even double or triple our police department uh, to uh, make Austin safer. Uh, man, we, uh, we we need that good relationship, even with the black community, because uh, uh, I believe the black and Hispanic community uh, definitely uh, need that good relationship as well. Uh, uh, so definitely, uh, I would say uh, uh, expand and grow the police department. Uh, and, and establish a good communication with the uh, community. Mr. Watson. Everybody in Austin has a right to be safe and they have a right to feel safe. And that's regardless of whether it's two o'clock in the morning and you think somebody's breaking your house or you're a person of color and your car has been stopped and you're being approached. No one should fear the police. We can have Austin values and a just system of policing by doing the right thing when it comes to recruitment, training, supervision, and then having a transparent accountability system. And that is not a binary choice with having a fully staffed police department. We need to have a fully staffed police department, and right now we're in a hole. So it's going to require some very intentional action in order for us to get out of that hole. It's going to require us, for example, to probably get a contract in place as fast as we can. Thanks. Representative Israel, how will you balance the safety needs of the city with improving the culture at APD and holding officers accountable for misconduct? This is personal to me. Um, as a child growing up in El Paso, Texas, um, my dad was a, a mean drunk and I had to call the sheriff's department on my dad several times to say someone's hurting mom, my dad's hurting mom. And I don't I say this because I want people to know I understand completely when you're in pain, when you're in crisis, when you call 911, you want somebody to be there for you, regardless of zip code, regardless of your life station. Um, 
The way that we get through this situation is by holding these police officers to a high standard. Um, I happen to go on the integral, integral care website because these police officers are also acting like social workers. I've done a ride along with them. They are dealing with situations that we have never seen before. There was over 50 openings at Integral Care for Mental Health. We, they need that support and our community Thank needs you. that trust. Thank you, Mrs. Representative Israel. That is your time. Mr. Brule. Uh, so Texas actually recommends that each city has two on-call officers per thousand people. We, we as a city have not hit that for about a decade now. Uh, we've also looked at what it costs, uh, what Austin can survive with, and they can survive with 25 to 50 officers uh, vacancies. Right now, Austin is somewhere around 180 vacancies, so we can see that we're very much behind. So what Austin needs to do is put in a, a reinvestment into the APD. But when we talk about reinvestment, we're not talking about more guns, more bullets, more handcuffs. We're talking about better training, like Kirk Watson just mentioned. We're talking about a police oversight office that does amazing work to work with the community. And one of the biggest things that we can do is community service for the officers. When we have more officers on the street, these officers are allowed to go interact with these communities, allowed to build relationships. So rather than looking like uh, the bad guy on the street, they can look like the friendly neighborhood officer. Thank you. Mr. Spellman. First and foremost, I want to take this opportunity to apologize to every single Austin police officer for the mayor falling asleep at a funeral. That's the problem we have right now. If you look at why we're in this situation, it's because our city council and our mayor do not like their police, and that's made obvious to everyone. And we talk about reimagining the police department. We can reimagine the police department so you reimagine crime. I look at the stats, 87 murders, uh, 491 rapes. The crime is just going up and up. And so like everyone made great points, we have to have a fully staffed police department. We have to hold anyone who messes up, whether it's a politician, a teacher, a doctor, a police person, has to be held accountable. This is what I mean about running on critical thinking and accountability. And then we have to look at why is this this situation? There's a lack of uh, respect for the badge right now in our country, and it's even worse here in Austin, Texas. Mr. Bradshaw. Yes, I just want to say, I know uh, Kurt Watson said he'll look at the budgets and see can we afford, uh, uh, can we afford to staff our police officers full time. I mean, whatever it takes to, for safety, I think, for Austin. Man, I mean, we have to go into the budget or whatever to fully staff our police officers. Man, we need to do it. Man, we need protection for our neighborhoods and for our community in Austin, Texas. Man, look here, we need our police department. No one going to be perfect in our police department. We know that. But look here, man, we, uh, we got police officers that are overworked, tired, and man, they need help. So, uh, so, so anyway, we can get them on. We need our police officers fully staffed to protect our community, our school children, uh, our, uh, you know, our kids at school. Uh, man, our hardworking men and women of Austin, Texas, they need, they need the support of the police officer. And, 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 and whatever it takes to support them, we need, we need to get behind that. Thank you. Would you like to respond? Only in, in saying I'm not sure exactly what uh, he was referring to, but I, I, I do believe, and I've said very clearly, we need to be, be fully staffed. Public safety needs to be a priority in this city. I'm pleased, for example, to have been endorsed by EMS and firefighters because of my belief in public safety, and, and they know uh, how I'll address that. We do need to get full staffing, and that's going to require us digging out of a hole. We're going to have to retain the officers that we currently have. We can't afford to lose any officers, but it's not a binary choice. We can have Austin values in the police department at the same time we're fully staffed and meeting the needs of the community. We have another lightning round question, and we're going to go to the viewers for this one. This comes from a viewer named David. In one word, who is your biggest campaign donor? Mr. Brule. Uh, deaf community. Mr. Bradshaw? No donor, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I fully support my I just, yeah. Representative Israel? My wife. Mr. Spellman? We donated $380,000. Mrs. Verdon? I don't know if you're referring to the personal loan that I made to my campaign, but if it's not that, then it's my husband. And Mr. Watson? Well, if this is asking about finances, Austin limits the amount that you can take to $450 a person. So it's, if, if more than, I've had more than a few people give me $450, so it'd be difficult for me to say who's the largest donor. Very good. We understand, we just want to make sure we get that viewer question in there. In fact, it's time to move to the viewer 
question portion of our debate. So these questions are open to whichever candidates would like to respond. If you want to respond to the question, just motion to us and you're going to have 30 seconds to answer each of these questions. So our first question of the night comes from Andrew, who lives in Southwest Austin. He says, quote, the Austin EMS Association fought for medics to receive a 38% pay raise across the board in order to catch up with inflation and make it possible for medics to live within the city. But the city council fought back hard, stating that was not feasible. The association had to settle for a one year contract at a fraction of the raise needed. Shortly after, City Council voted to give themselves a 38% pay increase, citing the same reasoning while refusing to push for civil servants to receive the same. Was this acceptable? How do you plan to keep our public servants living in the city that they risk their lives for? Mr. Brule, I saw you raise your hand first. Uh, it's definitely not acceptable. It was 90 seconds that City Council took to give themselves that massive raise. This office and city council should be looked at as a job for the people, not for themselves. They already get uh, wage increases to meet uh, cost of living annually anyway. So when it comes to the EMS Association, when it comes to teachers, when it comes to APD officers, when it comes to anyone serving the city and working for the city, I will strive to make sure that everyone can afford to live in this city. Mrs. Vernon. Not only am I the top proponent on this, on this uh, candidate slate, for public safety and public service, but of course, the fact that the uh, the city council gave themselves a raise and not our our public our public safety providers, um, I have to say that before ha before they gave themselves a raise, it was the guaranteed basic income that was uh, most egregious in my mind. That 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 is money they could have used to help uh, increase the salary for EMS. Representative Israel. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's telling that we don't have, uh, I, I did a ride along with EMS to, to experience what was happening. They are, they are like mobile uh, clinics, the, those trucks, and they are not getting the pay that they deserve. But it's also telling that we're, we're, people are being put on hold when they call 911. That's not acceptable. Another part of public safety is the fact that, uh, that in integral care has over 50 openings for case managers. When we look at public safety, all of these professionals, including our police, have got to work in unison in every single category. We don't have enough people there to help. Thank you. Our next viewer question comes from Susie, who lives in the Lamplight Village neighborhood in North Austin. Her question is, while Austinites like to espouse progressive values, segregation in our city's neighborhoods and schools is unfortunately very much still a problem. How will you encourage racial, racial and economic diversity throughout the city and our schools? Mr. Brule? Uh, one of the biggest things is not messing with I-35. I-35 itself is a racist highway and was used to segregate this city. One of the biggest things that we could do as a city to help uh, fix this issue is public transportation. Sally Israel has talked a lot about this uh, in the past. And basically, when you provide public transportation to these communities, you allow them to have access to other parts of the city, allow, allow them access to work, allow them to have access to not having a car in general. So when it comes to Project Connect, when it comes to CAP Metro, both of these programs need to look at the communities who are suffering most and see how they can service them better before uh, others. Senator Watson. I think we need to focus on and address some of the systemic problems that we have. I'll give one big example. Um, when, we, when we redevelop Miller, which is a great neighborhood, one of the things that we hoped would happen is you would have affordable housing and you would have more diversity. But we've discovered that you don't have the kind of diversity that we really wanted there. And a big part of that problem is the systemic problem with some people being able to have access to capital and to credit so that they can buy in and be a part of that. We're going to need to focus on actual systemic changes and, and be willing to experiment with new ways of getting things done along those lines. Thank you. Candidates will now have 45 seconds each to deliver their closing remarks. We plan to go in reverse alphabetical order, so we'll, we'll start with you, Mr. Watson. Well, I appreciate it, and I appreciate you all having this forum and everybody being here. Um, Austin needs to have a leader that has a proven track record and has a positive vision of the future that is inclusive, uh, that is positive, and that is able to, to bring about change and get the big things done. 
that, that means that this election is about uh, throwing away the labels that we put on each other and not having zero-sum games about uh, where somebody has to win and somebody has to lose. It means that we have to be willing to, to put forward change where it's not, uh, as I mentioned just a minute ago, a binary choice where one, one, you only have two choices. I think Austin's more creative and smarter than that. I'm offering a positive vision for our future where we can get big things done, and I ask for people's vote. Mrs. Verdon. Thank you. If you're happy with the direction that Austin has been going for the past five years, then you have plenty of choices here. If you're not happy with the direction that Austin has been going for the past five years and want to do things differently and better, then please vote for me. Under my leadership, we will focus on the true core purpose of city government, which is to provide a safe, clean and affordable city for all of its residents. This is the most pivotal election in Austin's history. Austin is too important. We cannot afford to take another chance on a Steve Adler, a Kirk Watson, or a Celia Israel. I'm Jennifer Verdon, a lifelong Austinite and a successful businesswoman, and I will restore common sense and public service back to the mayor's office. Mr. Spellman. Well, I'm glad she didn't mention me in that. Um, but I, I'm here because we need change. It's been 38 years this city's been run the same way. And if you can see there's a move coming and you just look at people like Telsey Gabbard, people live in the middle. And right now the Gallup poll says 40% of this country is an independent voter. We've got to do away with labels like Kirk said. You cannot continue to think you can run this city by always wanting your side to win, by dividing us, by making red versus blue, black versus white, gay versus straight. That's not the way you build community. And right now that's what we're looking at. Homeless people with homes. It's just, it's silly. We're fighting against each other, not getting anything done. Compromise and working together. That's what purple is. Representative Israel. This race is not about nostalgia. This race is about who can afford to live here and who gets to decide. I have the experience in the legislature and on several boards and commissions at the local level, and I have the lived experience and the heart to say that this city should be, should be welcoming people in instead of pushing them out. We do so at our own peril. We do so at the, at the risk of losing the spirit of Austin that brought me here in 1982. I refuse to accept that we're doing everything that we can. I have the experience and the tenacity, and as your mayor, I will bring that spirit and tenacity and the team to say Austin can do so much more. Mr. Brewer. Uh I asked the people of Austin to ask themselves some questions. Why did you move here? Why did you stay here? If you built a family here, why? Are those values still here? Are these the values you want for your kids? If you had neighbors or friends who left the city, why did they leave? Do you think it was fair? It's small things like this that we need to ask ourselves. If you're okay with everything so far, like Virden said, there are people on this stage who have done that, who are willing to do it and continue to do it. I strive to be the new face of politics because I'm fed up. The only reason I stand on this stage is because it can no longer happen anymore. And for that, I say thank you to the people of Austin. And finally, Mr. Bradshaw. Yes, I want to say uh, uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic, the people, for which you stand one nation under God. I want to say um, if you want somebody who's going to be in your corner, somebody who's going to fight for you and stand for those things that are are right for your community. Man, I wouldn't choose Kurt Watson. He's been there before, he's done it. I wouldn't vote for Cecilia. She's been there and done it. Man, you want somebody with a new vision for Austin, Texas that would make change, that would stand for you, that, that want to see you safe, want to see your community safe, want to see your people safe, want to see you be able to go out at nighttime. You want a strong police department that's going to uh, uh, be there for you. I'm for that. I'm for Austin. I'm, uh, I'm for a strong police department. I'm for uh, strong men, women here in Austin, Texas. I want to see success, prosperity, and good things happen for Austin, Texas, for the busing system, for the transit system. I want to see strong Austin, Texas. I want to see uh, Austin, Texas that is successful. Mr. Thank Bradshaw, you. we thank you. That is your All time. Right. Candidates, thank you for joining us tonight. If you missed any of the debate, you can go back and watch it on KVU.com, the KVU YouTube channel, or KVU Plus, which is available on Amazon Fire TV and Roku. This debate will also rerun on KVU on TV this Thursday at 4 p.m.
Now, a few reminders for you. Election day is Tuesday, November 8th. Early voting starts Monday, October 24th and ends November 4th. If you're planning to vote by mail, the deadline to apply for a mail-in ballot is October 28th. If none of the Austin mayoral candidates gets more than 50% of the vote, this race will go to a runoff with the top two candidates. That election would happen December 13th. You can find information about this race and all of the other races on the ballot, as well as the bonds and the KVU voter guide. You can text the word vote to the number on your screen there, 512-459-9442, and we'll send you a text with some helpful links. Don't forget to vote, Texas. Have a great night.